is a great hero. It's difficult, some 13 years later, to bring back that sense of urgency that existed during the Red River Rampage and the flooding of the Assiniboine. Yet, the 1950 flood is still fresh in the minds of people in Greater Winnipeg, in the basins of the two great rivers, across Canada and throughout the continent. Not many people know that disastrous floods occurred in 1826, in 1852, and in 1861. In 1956, had the weather been bad during the runoff period, the flood level could have been two feet higher than that of 1950. If this had occurred, all the dikes, including those built on top of the present permanent system, would have been overtopped. A large section of Greater Winnipeg and much of the Red River Valley would have been inundated. Even with favorable weather conditions, severe flooding did occur on the Assiniboine in 1956. Let's compare the 1950 flood with other major floods on the Red River. 1950, an elevation at the junction of the Red and the Cinnaboyne of 758.3 feet, 30.7 feet above city datum, or 12.7 feet above the flood stage. 1861, the river went two feet higher than in 1950, and in 1852, it went four feet higher than in 1950. 1826, six feet higher than in 1950. And even this is topped by a legendary flood in 1776. The Red River Basin investigation set up by the Government of Canada in 1950 and the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Branch of the Dominion Department of Agriculture estimated that under the worst combination of circumstances, a flood level in Winnipeg of from seven to eight feet higher than the 1950 flood could occur. The Assiniboine River is no angel. In fact, in 1882, the peak flow at Portage La Prairie is believed to have been more than twice that which occurred in 1956. Extreme climatic conditions cause extreme floods. The spring of 1950 was late, and it had rained without let-up. It was evident from the swollen waters of the Red that there would be trouble. There were other signs that this would be a spring we wouldn't forget. The muddy waters had gone up 10 feet above Datum in the towns near Winnipeg, and they were even now edging their way north towards the capital. A steady stream of refugees was appearing. People were worried, watching the red, measuring its current. As the water edged its way closer to the homes on its banks, the long, laborious job of diking began. The floodwaters were here in all their fury devastating the homes of ordinary men and women and their small share of earthly belongings. Inch by inch, these men and women fought the unharnessed, uncontrolled fury of nature. Volunteers came to man the defenses, the dikes. In every area of the city through which the red was now surging and rampaging, people were in a desperate, round-the-clock struggle through all of May. Clerks, stenographers, Salesmen, businessmen, working men, and farmers from the surrounding farms came to do battle. The truth must be faced. The flood could triple the lifeline of the city, cut its power, destroy communications, bring disease. But there is a bottomless source of power in men and women faced with impending disaster. The flood was rising, spreading. On May the 6th, the Army assumed responsibility for flood control activities. Under their command, they had 4,000 servicemen, some 50,000 civilian volunteers. An all-out battle now, man against nature. Towns like Morris to the south were deserted, barely visible in a lake 30 miles wide. Ordinary folk had waited in places like this to the last minute, and then left their dreams behind. No man surrenders willingly his home, his land, and the fruits of his labors. The flood was engulfing Winnipeg house by house, and everyone who could in this prairie metropolis was fighting back. From the armed services came army trucks, half a million sandbags, the main ammunition in this battle against nature. And tons of heavy equipment from all over raced to Winnipeg in three days of Operation Red Rat, perhaps the largest airlift in Canadian history. The rest depended on these people. There was much to be done. The evacuation of hospitals was organized. The river was threatening one, lapping at the foundations of another. By May the 8th, patients were moved to waiting vehicles to other hospitals and other cities. People not engaged in the battle against the Red were urged to leave the city. On May the 11th, 40,000 had already left. 
one-eighth of Greater Winnipeg was underwater. 10,500 homes were flooded. 100,000 people had to leave everything at the height of the flood. May the 11th, the red licked at the streets one block away from the heart of the city on Portage and Main. This car could be hoisted up, and it escaped. But the river pressed against this house and set it adrift. It was all the same. St. Patel, Wildwood, Fort Garry, Riverview, Elmwood, East Gildonan, few had been spared. The dissatisfied red had become a sea and was looking around for more fields to conquer. The moment of crisis had arrived. Tired, numb men and women who had earned the right to hope prayed that they had indeed turned the river back. At last, on the morning of May the 19th, the Red River dropped half an inch. And when you returned, home was Heartbreak House. The estimate of damage was already in the tens of millions. The flood at last was going down half inch by half inch. Having helped to save a city, a man could turn to take stock of his own misfortune. You moved from room to room and there was nothing but ruin. You touched once familiar things, grotesque and slime and filth. You glanced at the basement, still overflowing. By the end of this soggy, dreary May, men, women, and children set themselves to the task of rebuilding their lives again. Out of the hideous mud would come a clean home, a garden, and the clanging sounds of machinery would be replaced by the light-hearted sounds of people. The flood might come again, but now it was important for life to return to normal. Does man who conquers disease, subdues nature, competes for the conquest of the moon, have to accept defeat by a river? In this day and age, must man be servant or master? But it is as certain as the law of mathematical probability that if he lives in Greater Winnipeg and the Red River Valley, he will experience a flood of 1950 severity or greater on the average of once every 36 years. The Assiniboine Valley in certain areas could be flooded at much more frequent intervals. Damage could be particularly severe in the Portage to Headingley areas. Faced with the certainty of floods, we can do one of two things. Accept the damages from flood when they arise, or take engineering steps to reduce or prevent them. By computing the probable flood frequency, the size of floods, and the amount of damage likely to be done, the Royal Commission on Flood Cost Benefit, appointed by the government of Manitoba in 1956, estimates that by acting now, we could save $2.73 for every $1 we invest. $1 for the floodway today saves $2.73 on flood loss tomorrow. If the present diking system should fail, the Flood Commission estimates that with a repetition of the 1950 flood, losses would total $114 million. 1861 level, losses would be $266 million. 1852 level, losses would be $583 million. If we go unprotected and floods hit the 1826 elevation, just six feet higher than the 1950 floods, our costs would reach over $800 million. Astronomical, isn't it? And this was on the basis of population figures and property values of 1957. Recent studies reveal that the cost figures would increase. For example, the investment in the University of Manitoba alone has gone up $20 million during this period and will go up another $30 million in the next 10 years. Floods do not occur with any regularity, even with an expected frequency of once in 36 years. That once may be next year. The Royal Commission, after two years of inquiry and findings, brought in the following recommendations in 1958. A greater Winnipeg floodway with a capacity of 60,000 cubic feet per second at an estimated cost of $63,200,000. Construction of a dam and storage reservoir at Shelmo that will cost around $7,500,000. Actually, this is a relocation of the Russell Reservoir project. The portage diversion is a partial rerouting of the Assiniboine River to Lake Manitoba with a capacity of 25,000 cubic feet per second at an estimated cost of $11,500,000. 
While the primary purpose of these projects is flood protection, one of them, the Shellmouth Portage Program, would also meet the water requirements throughout the Assiniboine Valley until the year 2000. It also creates a lake which will have recreational and water conservation benefits. The three projects cost about $83 million, and they will ensure virtually complete flood protection to all parts of Greater Winnipeg behind the main diking system for all floods up to 169,000 cubic feet per second which is, incidentally, 60% higher than the 1950 peak. Protected, too, will be the valley flats between Shellmouth and Brandon, as well as a large portion of the province's population and productive capacity. The Commission also recommends an engineering study of the potentialities of the Pembina Dam to be built on the Pembina River near the international border. A three-year study was undertaken in 1962 and will be completed in 1964 at a cost of $300,000. 21 dams have been completed since 1958, and 23 others are proposed throughout the province. The floodway is more economical and reliable protection for Greater Winnipeg than any other method that could be devised. Its construction would involve no major disturbance of industrial activity in the city. The majority of the Royal Commission had no hesitation in accepting and recommending the floodway as the main form of flood protection for Greater Winnipeg. Some people have said, why don't we simply clear the Lister Rapids? And the Royal Commission, after studying all alternatives, has said because the benefits couldn't justify the cost to the extent the floodway can. Why don't we simply widen and deepen the rest? Because it would cost double the floodway. Why don't we simply build dams upstream in the Red River Valley? Because, says the Commission, 80% of the waters start to the south of us in the United States, and we simply have no control over them. Even if we had control, this is not feasible because of the flat topography of the Red River Valley. There are no sites available on which big enough dams could be built. It would take 2,000 reservoirs the size of that at Morton to give the same protection as the floodway at 10 times the cost. The St. Agathe Detention Basin was considered and discarded because if floods hit even the 1950 level, all southern Manitoba would be turned into one big sea. Why not an insurance fund? Because the cost of premiums to those in danger of flooding would be out of line with the benefits derived. The Assiniboine River Diversion is the most economical and reliable method of controlling the lower Assiniboine. It gives protection to the area between and including the cities of Portage and Winnipeg by diverting waters during high flows from the Assiniboine to Lake Manitoba. It enables us to use the lake as a reservoir this is particularly valuable to Manitoba during years of low inflow, valuable for recreation, wildlife, and fishing. By storing water in the lake, we can return flows through a supply canal to the Assiniboine during these periods of low flow. Consider this paradox. The Assiniboine that can carry 40% of its total annual flow within one month in May can also be so dry that it carries only 1% of that flow during the month of February. We have already built the Fairford Diversion Channel and Control Structure. This enables us to keep the lake from going to extremely high levels. And with the Portage Diversion on the Assiniboine, we have a way of firming up low water levels. The Greater Winnipeg Floodway Plan involves a bypass channel that would divert part of the flood flows on the Red River around the east side of the Greater Winnipeg area. The proposed floodway route would leave the Red River near St. Norbert pass to the east of Transcona, proceed through a natural depression in Birds Hill, and return to the river about one half mile below St. Andrew's Dam. The overall length would be over 30 miles. On October the 6th, 1962, a powerful bulldozer gouged a chunk of earth from the ground east of Winnipeg as an official start was made on the biggest excavation project in Canadian history recommended by both the federal and provincial inquiries. Digging of the Red River floodway began with Premier Duff Roblin and Federal Natural Resources Minister Walter Dinsdale teamed as co-drivers of the bulldozer that ripped out the first sod at St. Anne's Road, just south of... Acting as chairman, Manitoba Agriculture Minister George Hutton predicted that with the completion of this massive undertaking in the spring of 1968, the frightening prospects of disastrous flooding in the greater Winnipeg area would be but a memory. 
Lesson two would be the pollution and the odor and the sudsy detergent mess churned up by the pulsating waters. This is how Mr. Hutton puts it. The floodway, the cost of which is shared by the provincial and federal governments, involves the moving of 100 million cubic yards of earth, 30% more than the excavation of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and 40% as great as the Panama Canal. The people of the province will gain at least 10 million man hours of employment. At the peak of construction, over 1,000 men will be employed on the project proper. In addition to this, bridges, diversion structures, and all the other related activities will give additional millions of man hours of employment for thousands of Manitobans. The very first two contracts went to contractors in the town of Riverton, Manitoba, and the city of Winnipeg. This is not just a master plan to save a city. Yet what happens to metropolitan Winnipeg affects the rest of the province, since one half of the population of Manitoba choose to live here. This is where most of our great colleges and universities are centered. Here we find our hospitals, our great medical centers, our factories and marketing agencies. Here we have our biggest market for the goods and services produced on the farm. Here is located our capital city. It can happen again. Call the road, St. Germain Underwater, and Portage La Prairie, and Brandon and Grand Point, and St. Norbert. Call the road, Millwood, St. Francis, Eli, Oak Bank, and Winnipeg. Name an area, East Kildonan, West Kildonan, Elm Park, St. Boniface, Wild Kingston Crescent, Fort Gary, Riverview, Lindale. Name a street, Water Street, Layton Avenue, Maryland Street, Glenwood Crescent, Scotia and Wellington Crescent, and Marion Street, Mill Street, and Main Street. Name a family, the Stevensons, the Sockers, the Thompsons, the Haters, the Itztows, the Skomorowskis, and so many Smiths and Johnstons, too. Name a company, Crane, and Brown and Rutherford, James B. Carter, and Scott Bathford, Canada Packers, and the little Morley Grocery on the corner in Riverview. Count the class in terms of human misery and suffering, and wasted man hours, in terms of money. And you must come to the decision that it is worth making sure that it will never happen again. Time and the river wait for no man.